Hello, my name is Michelle and I'm coming to you from the children's room in the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And I'm so happy that you're joining me for a read aloud. Today we're going to read The Water Horse, which is written by Dick King Smith, illustrated by David Parkins, published by Crown Publishers in 1990. And I'm excited to read this to you. Chapter one, an old fish's egg. It was Kirsty who found it. It was lying just above the high tide mark, a squarish package shaped object, the color of seaweed with a long tendril sticking out from each of its four corners. It was exactly the shape, in fact, of the mermaid's purses, the little horny egg capsules of the dogfish that were commonly washed up on the beach but this one was the size of a large cookie tin. Look what I found, shouted Kirsty. Come quick and look. In the small hours of March the 26th, 1930, a great storm struck the west coast of Scotland. The huge seas that it had whipped up smashed against the foot of the cliffs and the tigerish tempest ran up the face of them and grabbed a small white house on the cliff top in its jaws. The house quivered and shook in the teeth of the wind and Kirsty, waking in sudden fright was sure the roof would fly away. The noise of the storm was fearful. Angus will be terrified, thought Kirsty, and she jumped out of bed and ran to her little brother's room next door. Her mother arrived at the same moment carrying an oil lamp and by its light, they could see that Angus was sleeping peacefully, sleeping like the baby he had been only a few years before. Outside, the thunder banged and the lightning flashed and the wind roared and the rain poured. Angus snored. Back to bed, Kirsty said her mother. I'll stay here a while in case he wakes. What about Grumbles, said Kirsty? Is he all right? And before I go to the next page, here's the first illustration. It's the house with the sea up against it. Grumbles was mother's father who lived with them. When Kirsty was very small, she had heard mother say angrily to him one day, all you ever do is grumble, grumble. And so she had thought that it was his name. It suited him. He came stumping along the corridor now, a big old man with a thick droopy mustache. Can't sleep a week, growled Grumble to his daughter and granddaughter as though it were their fault. Terrible weather. Lord help sailors on a night like this. Kirsty and mother grinned at one another, for Kirsty's father was a sailor, a merchant seaman. But at that moment, his ship was, they knew, in quiet tropical waters, far from tonight's frenzied Atlantic storm. At that moment, there came a clap of thunder so close and so loud that Angus awoke and sat up in bed. I heard a noise he said in a matter-of-fact voice. It's a storm, Angus, said Kirsty. a big storm. Going to blow the house down in a minute, I shouldn't be surprised, said Grumble. Just for a moment, the wind dropped a little and they could all clearly hear the crash of the breakers on the beach below. What would the sea throw up, Kirsty wondered. What would they find on the shoreline tomorrow? All of them loved beachcombing, even Grumble, though he pretended he didn't and a storm like this would leave lots of driftwood for them to collect. Back to sleep, every, sleep, everyone, mother said, and in the morning, we'll all go down and see what we can find. What do you mean in the morning, said Grumble. It's morning now. I shan't be able to drop off again, that's for sure. You should count some sheep, Grumble, said Angus. That's what I do. You can only count to 10, Kirsty said. I know, when I get to 10, I start again, said Angus firmly, and he lay down and shut his eyes. Back in bed, Kirsty lay listening to the roar of the storm. She was as wide awake, she felt, as it was possible to be. And then, quite suddenly it seemed, it was broad daylight. Kirsty was too excited to eat much breakfast. The worst of the storm had passed. Now the wind had dropped a bit and mother had promised that they would go down to the beach as soon as breakfast was finished and the dishes were washed up. It was the thought of what might be washed up on shore that was exciting to Kirsty. Beachcombing was such fun. You never knew what you might find. 
there were always lots of seaweed and creatures like starfish and jellyfish and sea urchins and loads of shells, whelks and cockles and cowries and razor shells. Then there was trash, like empty bottles. Perhaps one might have a message in it from a castaway. And of course there was driftwood, wooden boxes and crates, planks, spars, once even a pair of oars. And the strange twisted shape of branches and sometimes quite large limbs of trees worn pale and smooth during their long voyages from goodness knows where. With such a storm as last night's, who knew what they might find? Eat up, Kirsty, mother said. Angus never needed to be given this order. Meals, in his view, were times for eating, not talking. From sitting up at the table to getting down from it again, he only opened his mouth to put food in it. What do you think we'll find, Angus, said Kirsty. Angus stared at her, his jaws chomping rhythmically. He did not answer. Aren't you excited? Kirsty asked. Angus nodded placidly. My egg's not boiled enough, said Grumble. They set out at last down the cliff path, Kirsty leading, carrying a little sack for putting things in, Mother following, holding Angus by the hand, and Grumble stumping along behind with a big sack and a length of cord to tie up bundles of driftwood. The seas were running very strongly still, and the breakers were huge but distant now, for the spring tide had ebbed. The pebbly beach was, as always, empty of people. The only living things on it were just two seagulls picking at something that lay just above the high tide mark. They flew up as Kirsty ran forward. Come and look, she shouted, quick. What is it? Mother shouted back. I don't know. It looks like a giant mermaid's purse. Angus ran as fast as his short legs would allow. He looked critically at the object. The gulls could not have been at it for long for it seemed unharmed. I didn't know there were giant mermaids, said Angus. No dogfish could produce a thing like that, said Mother, when she and Grumble arrived. Why, it must be 20 times as big as an ordinary mermaid's purse. What do you think, Dad? Could it have come from a, some huge creature like a basking shark? Don't ask me, said Grumble. We're here to collect firewood, so let's get on with it. The cold wind gets right in my bones. Here's another illustration, if you can see. He prodded the thing with his foot. Whatever it is, it's no use to us, he said, and he stomped on with mother following. It moved, Kirsty said. Course it did, said Angus. Grumble kicked it. No, I mean, after he kicked it, I saw the outside of it, the skin of it move. I'm almost sure I did. It sort of trembled. Angus peered at the giant mermaid's purse. It isn't trembling now, he said. Spect it's dead, spect he killed it. He looked up at his sister and saw that she was upset at this thought. It's only an old fish's egg, he said. Eggs don't feel anything. Those ones that mother boiled for breakfast, they didn't feel nothing. They didn't feel anything, said Kirsty. Angus sighed. I just told you that, he said. Sometimes I feel much older than you. Well, you're not, said Kirsty quite sharply. You are three years younger. Hold my sack open for me. And she bent down and picked up the thing. It was heavy as heavy indeed as a large cookie tin full of cookies. You're not going to take it home, said Angus. I am. Where are you gonna put it then? In a bucket of water, just in case it's alive. It might hatch, you never know. Mother won't like it. Mother won't know. She'll ask what's in your sack. Kirsty thought quickly, seaweed. She said, Grumble puts it on the garden for manure. And on top of the thing, she placed some bunches of kelp. When they had all climbed the cliff path again, Grumble complaining loudly of the weight of the driftwood bundle he carried, the children went off together to the garden, a small plot on the sheltered side of the white cliff top. Here their grandfather grew vegetables, grumbling endlessly about the poorness of the soil, the unkindness of the weather, and the damage done to his plants by birds and slugs and caterpillars. Kirsty put the seaweed on his compost heap, pilled, filled a large bucket with water, and tipped the giant mermaid's purse into it. It was too big to submerge and two of its four tendrils stuck out forlornly above the surface. It's too big, Angus said. I can see that silly, said Kirsty, but at least it will keep it from drying out. What's it matter if it's dead anyway? We don't know it's dead. Well, it soon will be. Why, Angus sighed. 
it came out of the sea, didn't it? That's tap water. It needs salt water. Angus, cried Kirsty. She gave him a hug. You're brilliant, she said. I know. Making sure that mother was elsewhere, Kirsty got the container of salt from the pantry and poured a generous measure into the bucket. She looked carefully at the sticking out tendrils, but they didn't move. It needs a bigger place, she said. I know, the bathtub. How the rest of that day dragged, but at the end of it, luck was on their side. Mother had a bath after her morning's work. Grumble on being asked said, no, he didn't want a bath. Too much washing was bad for your skin. And anyway, the water was always either too hot or too cold. So that only left the children. Mother gave Angus his bath at bedtime and left the water in it for Kirsty. Kirsty, He wasn't all that dirty, she said, and she took Angus downstairs to dry him by the fire, where Grumble sat listening to the radio, turned up rather loud, for he was rather deaf, and moaning that the program was rubbish. Kirsty moved fast. First, she let out Angus's bath water. Then she put the plug back in, turned on the cold tap, and tiptoed down the stairs and out into the garden. In a couple of minutes, she was back in the bathroom, the giant mermaid's purse in both hands, the container of salt tucked under one arm. She lowered her burden gently into the water, added a little hot for luck, poured the whole contents of the salt container in, turned off the taps and went out of the bathroom, closing the door. Kirsty awoke once in the middle of the night and could not resist opening the bathroom door and peeping in but the thing was just floating motionless. You're stupid, she said to herself as she was drifting back to sleep again. It's probably just a piece of seaweed, that's all. First thing in the morning, before anyone's up, I'll take it out and chuck it on Grumble's compost heap. First thing in the morning, Kirsty went quietly along to the bathroom. She had just grasped the handle of the door when she thought she heard something. She bent down her ear to the keyhole through it, she could hear a small splashing, such as a little fish might make, breaking the surface of a stream. And then a small squeaking noise, a kind of chirp, such as a little bird might make, breaking from the shell of its egg. Kirsty opened the bathroom door. Chapter two is called, It's a Monster. One look into the bathtub was enough to send her hurrying to get Angus. As usual, he awoke from the deepest of sleeps with his mind instantly turned to his chief pleasure. I'm hungry, said Angus. Is breakfast ready? Shh, said Kirsty. Don't talk so loud. We mustn't wake mother or grumble. Why not? Because it's hatched the thing in the bathtub. Blow me down, said Angus. Angus enjoyed using what he thought to be terrible swear words. And his father on his last shore leave had taught him a careful selection of sailor's oaths. They crept into the bathroom and stood side by side, gazing into the water. Look, said Kirsty. Shiver my timbers, said Angus. The giant mermaid's purse lay on the bottom at the plug hole end like a sunken wreck. Wrecked it was too, with a gaping hole in one side where something had emerged. At the other end of the bathtub swam that something. When Kirsty was a grown woman with a family of her own, her children would ask her time and again to describe what it was that she saw in the bathtub that early March morning when she was eight years of age. It was a little animal, she told them, such as neither I nor your Uncle Angus had ever seen before, such as no one in the world had ever seen before, in fact. In size, it was about as big as a newborn kitten, but quite a different shape. The first thing you noticed about it was its head, which was sticking out of the water on the end of quite a long neck. More than anything, it looked like a horse's head with wide nostrils like a horse and even a suggestion of pricked ears. And here is a picture. But its body was more like a turtle's. I don't mean it had a shell. It had a kind of warty skin like a toad's, greeny grayish in color, but it had four flippers like a turtle has. And then it had a tail like a crocodile. But just like you usually look at people's faces before you notice anything else about them, the thing that struck us was the look of its head. 
we didn't think about a crocodile or a toad or a turtle. We thought about a little horse. Now, as Kirsty and Angus watched the creature, which had been eyeing them in silence, dive with a plop, swam underwater with strokes of <clears throat> its little flippers, and surfaced again <clears throat> right in front of them. It looked at them and chirped. What does it want, Kirsty said. The answer to this question was obvious to someone like Angus. Food, of course, he said. It's hungry like me. What shall we give it? What do you suppose it will eat? What do you suppose it is anyway? We don't even know what sort of animal it is. It's a monster, said Angus confidently. He had a number of picture books about monsters and obviously this was one of them. But monsters are big, Kirsty said. Angus sighed. This isn't a monster monster. This is a baby one. A baby sea monster, said Kirsty. Well, then it would eat fish, wouldn't it? We'll have to catch some fish for it. A happy smile lit up Angus's round face. We don't need to, he said. There's some sardines in the pantry. I like sardines. Opening the sardine can was difficult, but Kirsty managed to turn the key far enough to winkle one out and they tiptoed upstairs again, carrying it on a saucer. Don't give it everything. It might not like it, said Angus, hopefully. But when Kirsty pulled off a bit of sardine with her fingers and dropped it into the bathtub, the little animal snapped it up and gulped it down and chirped loudly for more. It likes it, said Angus. He broke off another piece of the fish, his hand moving automatically toward his mouth. But Kirsty said Angus sharply, so he dropped it in the tub, contenting himself with licking the oil off his fingers. And one after the other, they fed the creature the rest of the sardine. Then they went down to the pantry again to see if they could get another one out of the can. With great effort, for the key was very stiff to turn, Kirsty had at last got the can fully open when suddenly they heard footsteps on the stairs and mother came into the kitchen. Kirsty, she said, whatever are you up to? Who told you you could help yourself to sardines? And long before breakfast too. It's for our sea monster, said Angus. Don't be so silly, Angus, said mother sharply. Look at your fingers, all oily, you greedy little boy. And you, Kirsty, you're old enough to know better. We haven't eaten any, mother, honestly, said Kirsty. And we have got a sea monster, we truly have. Now you listen to me, Kirsty, said mother. Whatever it is that you two have brought home, a lobster, a crab, whatever it is that you're wasting my expensive sardines on, you will take it straight back. Do you hear me? Oh no, mother, cried Kirsty. please not. First thing after breakfast, it goes back in the sea, said mother firmly. Where is it anyway? In the bathtub, cried Anxious. Angus. In the bathtub, said mother. Oh no, it's quite happy there, said Angus. Well, that's more than your grandfather will be by now. As I came down, I saw him going along the corridor with his towel and his shaving kit. He will have a fit, especially if it's still hungry, said Angus. But when the three of them reached the bathroom, the door was open and there was Grumble kneeling by the bathtub. With his bald head and his droopy mustache, he looked like a walrus about to take a dip. He was staring silently at the little animal as it padded around in the water, paddled, now glistening with sardine oil. To their amazement, they saw that he was smiling broadly, grumble smiling. It's that thing you found on the beach after the storm, isn't it, Kirsty? Yes, grumble, it hatched in the night. I made her put salt in the water, said Angus. I doubt you need have bothered with that, said grumble. It's an air breathing beastie, you see, like a seal. Fresh water or salt, I doubt it matters, so long as it has plenty of fish to eat. We've given it a sardine, said Kirsty. Grumble got to his feet. You've a clever couple of kids here, he said to mother. How I wish I could have found such a thing when I was their age. There were many stories then of this creature, and I believed all of them, but I never thought I would see one. You sound as though you know what this thing is, said mother. I should, said Grumble. Wasn't I born and brought up on the banks of Loch Marar? And wasn't there supposed to be one of these living in that very loch? What is it, Grumble? asked Kirsty. Before I tell you, said Grumble, you must promise faithfully to tell no one outside the family, not a word to any of your friends, understand? And here's Grumble talking to them. 
Oh yes, yeah, said Christy, cross my heart. And she crossed it and Angus crossed his stomach, perhaps by mistake, but possibly because it was to him the most important organ. Right, said Grumble, then I'll tell you, it's a monster. I told you, said Angus. Always there have been tales of sightings of such a beastie, sometimes at sea, more often in a lock, said Grumble. Oh, when I was a boy, how I longed to see the Kelpie. Is that what it's called, said Kirsty? That's one name for it, said Grumble, but the other is the one that I like most. most. Most folks call it the water horse. And that is the end of chapter two. We have been reading The Water Horse by Dick King Smith, illustrated by David Parkins and published by Crown Publishers. Um, join me next time and we will read the next part of the story together. Um, and I am Michelle coming to you from the children's room at the Portland Public Library. Bye.